What is next, Scott? The dogs of war. So I'll hand over to me. It's hi, diddle dee dee, a mercenary's <laughs> life for me. Uh, Christopher Walken's gun for hire, James Shannon, escapes one war torn situation only to return home to America with about as much welcome to it for him. Not for long, though. He's soon approached by corporate interests with an assignment to reconnoitre Zangaro, the African state twinned with Valverde. <laughs> after, after achieving a measure of post colonialisation democracy, the winner of their first election, General Kimbas, decided that's quite enough of that, imprisoning, killing, or exiling his rivals in that race and setting up a good old fashioned hunter. However, he's not playing nice with the mineral exploitation rights, hence the corporate interest in him. Off Shannon goes, posing as a nature photographer to at least partially allay the suspicions of the paranoid Kimber regime, shown the lay of the land by some unhelpful local guides and a rather more helpful Irish journalist, Colin Blakely's Alan North, he sneaks out to find the weak points in the central compound's defences. It doesn't go entirely smoothly, complications leading to him being, if not exactly discovered detained after the military just jumps to the correct conclusion and present him with a sound beating. He's only saved from death by the administrations of jailed ex-presidential candidate Dr Okoye by Winston Natosha and the threat of some bad publicity from North's reporting. Bundled on a plane back to America, he submits his report, but liking the cut of his jib, the said corporate interest decide he's just the man to plan and head up a bit of regime change with the aim of installing Colonel Hallis's Colonel Bobby as a more friendly option. <laughs> Unfortunately, in Scotland, Bobby has a very different meaning. <laughs> Reluctantly, Shannon makes the choice to endanger what's left of his relationship with his ex-wife to front this operation and goes about the business of convincing his gang of mercenaries to join in, training Colonel Bobby's troops, planning the operation and working out the black magic, black, <laughs> black market logistics. This all takes a perhaps a surprising amount of the running time in a modern cinema landscape that I suspect couldn't resist cramming all of that into a montage and getting straight to the shooting, which in this film comes very late to the party. And while for the most part that action is handled adequately, daft grenade launcher thingy aside, it's not really the point of Dogs of War, which is much happier looking at the bigger plan and at the worldview that this sort of activity imparts on Shannon and the great divergence between that and normal society. Now, this, as it turns out, is exactly my sort of jam, so I found this reasonably enjoyable, although I recognise it is by no means a particularly amazing film. It's pinned down by a restrained performance from Walken, who I occasionally forget can be an actor when he's not being a character, sure. Being, and, being a Walken, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and the nuts and bolts of arranging the overthrow attempt is very interesting to me, at least. Uh, it's mildly marred by an ending that I'm not convinced Shannon's characterization quite backs up and will almost certainly be rectified by others halfway through the credits, but that's a very small element of the piece as a whole. Now, perhaps it's not worth making extraordinary efforts to watch, but it's a solid slow-burning entry in this little subgenre that's not exactly overserved, so gets a few extra points for that at least. And, well, any film that reminds me of The Last King of Scotland can't be a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, this is... It's all right. Mm. Uh, I really struggle to to say much more about it. Like the day of the jackal, uh, and you met, you mentioned it's got the just like the the meticulous planning. Yeah, that's really satisfying to watch. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, it's a very small part of the film, but yeah. that bit's satisfying. It's just them making the preparations, hiding the weapons, and things like that. Yeah, it's a strange thing to say about a film, but I could have done with about half an hour more of haggling about the price of ornaments. <laughs> that sort of thing is. <laughs> I'll throw in this box of black magic. <laughs> the bit at the end, I kind of saw coming, uh, yeah. like the the twist that Chris Falken's character pulls, uh, because otherwise it would be a really really horrible ending. Yeah, and it it does tie in somewhat to a character arc they're trying to build of him <laughs> trying to get out of his life and trying to redeem yeah. himself a little bit, but it doesn't. It, it's that's not been enough to the forefront to really earn that ending again. Yeah, yeah and I mean the film is as with other stuff, kind of grounded. There's nothing, apart from that grenade launcher, which is apparently the same as some tanks. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's reasonably believable. And uh, yeah, nothing hugely far-fetched, because I think if you, this small African country, if you took over that one building in the capital, <laughs> probably you could be able to, like, you know, effect change and give mm -hmm. out the new documents with the new person's name on it and things. Mm -hmm. The big problem that I have with this film and the reason I don't enjoy it more is that there is not a single likeable character in the entire film. 
Yeah. Maybe true. maybe the doctor that helps from the prison, but he's a very, very minor character. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean the the reporter, you get the feeling that while he's kinda of looking for a story, it's like he's trying to say like show do proper journalism say these are the horrible things happening in this country. Mm-hmm. Other than that, there isn't a single likable character because Christopher Walken's certainly not it because no. he's the head of a mercenary group who's going to overthrow the leader of a country because some Western company wants to make some money out of the country. You know, it's the, yes. it's just bad people all around. Yeah, it's replacing with a different dictator. So, so well, good. yes, <laughs> um, there, there's. It's not like this film operates in. Um, shades of grey and it's all black it's <laughs> all dark it's all bad um, and then you know you have Tom Berenger being the typical Tom Berenger role of just being a deeply unlikable and unpleasant person um, mm-hmm. not to the extent he's in platoon or anything but you know he's still it's like yep Tom Berenger <laughs> bit of a get then um, and yeah it's, there are moments that I enjoy Christopher Walken certainly is the highlight of the film acting wise because you, you do you do feel that he, there's something under there that he's in this life, and but his the fact that he's like right, I'm out of this. I've been tortured um, for an entire day. Apparently, um, mm-hmm. it's a strange bit of the film. He says um, the guy challenges him to go back to this country to take back what was taken from you. But you've clearly established that he was tortured for a day. Now I'm not <laughs> saying it was pleasant, but it was a day. You know, it wasn't in a prisoner war camp for three years or something like that. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, but you can his motivation for deciding to go against these newly blossoming morals and ethics and go and kill a bunch of people um, for basically being paid to murder because that's what he's doing he's being paid to murder um, happens because the woman he loved didn't immediately decide to uproot her entire life <laughs> in mean, one evening after they haven't seen each other for three years so you know it's, it's not particularly compelling even yeah. though he sells that as best as he possibly can Yes, yeah, it's, it's okay, but it's yeah, it, it's really probably satisfying. it's it's a bit better than I expected because uh, I stumbled across a, a, a semi trailer ish for this. It was like a little clip that they showed on Amazon Prime Video, I think, and uh, <laughs> that one bit it was when he's trying to sneak into the country through customs as a uh, nature journalist and. It was reminding me a little bit of Max Zorn, and I was just wondering if he was going to play the entire <laughs> film as Max Zorn, which I thought could have been awesome. Um, you know, dreadful, but awesome. Uh, but he doesn't do that. Instead, he actually does a, a really good job of painting as complicated as he can make a character that's not actually that complicated. I think it. I think you get the feeling it, it wishes to be much more deeper and complex than it actually has been written, but and he's doing his best to elevate it but yeah um i'd probably caution people that if you don't have a sort of the affinity for this sort of thing as i think we all do the kind of slower burning thrillery type stuff you won't get a lot out of it um, and certainly nothing like as much as you would from uh, either day of the jackal in particular or even the decifile uh, this is something yeah. a step down from either of those i still enjoyed it quite a lot um i uh, uh, but i do recognize that i'm perhaps in the exactly the right spot in the venn diagrams for this kind of thing so I, yeah i enjoyed it but it's it's uh provisos sort of the bazoo for me with it yes so. yes with the exception of, excuse me, with the the jackal which we have right to yeah. read already, so set that aside. It for me, it's the least essential of the four Frederick Forsyth film adaptations. Mm-hmm. Um, there are moments that are good. Unfortunately, there was one other slight problem I had because I was feeling it was not dragging so much, and just, I, I couldn't really get invested in it because I still like, yeah, he's been paid to do this to help a company. You know, yeah, the yeah, corporations are evil. You know, it's I don't really need to see that again. And having your main character working for a corporation is, but when he goes to what's the place called? I've, <laughs> Zangora, Sanjeev. I forgot the name of it. Sangaro. Sangaro. Okay. Um, when he goes to Sanjeev, um, <laughs> he's. Um, Presumably it's very, very young Hugh Quarsh and Jim Broadbent in this film, just uh, as an aside. But, mm. uh, he's met by this guy who goes out in the jeep with him to look at uh, birds. And I haven't looked up, but I'm 99% certain he's Matthew from Desmond's. And um, <laughs> and if he isn't Matthew from Desmond's, he looks almost, almost exactly like Matthew from Desmond's. And so for a good... 20 minutes of the film I was thinking about Desmond's instead I've not seen Desmond's in 25 years <laughs> and so, okay maybe this that tells a lot of the film that it's kind of lost my 
and I lost my attention span for a quarter of its running time because I'm thinking about a 1980s Channel 4 sitcom instead. Mm. <laughs> I know it's a particularly weird thing to say, but I'm a particularly weird person. But nonetheless, I was thinking about Desmond's for 20, 25 minutes of this film. <laughs> <laughs> no pork pie, though. But yeah, it's uh, it's okay. And Christopher Walken's quite compelling in it. Easy to forget now when you see him with things like Seven Psychopaths with his um, ludicrous hair and his kind of mad staring eyes that he used to be quite a pretty guy. Yeah. It's like, hmm, okay. But I have no point. I was just like, <laughs> so struck by yeah. um, that how uh, physically he seems so different to, to now that that's not what you strikes you about him anymore. Cool story, bro. <laughs> <laughs> 25 minutes of this film thinking about Desmond's Creek it was talking to all my attention for some parts can you tell it's been 25 minutes of the podcast talking about how pretty Chris Walken used to be listen he was a handsome guy let's leave it at that <laughs>